Rules. They are there to preserve order in society. Some say rules are made to be broken. Others follow them right to the last letter. In BattleBots, it's no different. Every season, a new BattleBots rule set gets released to the fans and builders, explaining everything from what you can put in your robot to what happens if you start a rebellion in the pits. But how did we end up with the guidelines that BattleBots released for 2021? What events and dramas have happened in the past that have caused some of these rules to be put in place? Well, that's what we'll be discussing today. In order to make my job slightly easier, most of this video focuses on the modern era of the show. But first, we're going to take a look at this document I found from 1999. As you can see, it outlines the definition and weight bonus that Walkerbots received in this time period. Pretty generous bonuses, right? Especially if you were a shufflebot like Son of Waiachi. Nowadays, we define shufflebots as robots with legs that move continuously on a system of cams and linkages, like this. But back then, there was no distinction between a true Walkerbot like Mechadon and anything else that just didn't use wheels. That was until Son of Waiachi came along. It was eligible for the weight bonus because it didn't have wheels, but it wasn't using that extra weight for locomotion. Son of Waiachi's notorious cage spinner took it all the way to the Season 3.0 finals, where it beat favourites Biohazard and became the heavyweight champion. However, the rules were promptly changed, and Shufflebots no longer received the weight bonus of true walkers with independent legs. All of a sudden, Son of Waiachi had to fight robots that were no longer half its weight, and it could never really replicate its 2001 success. But that's not where the Walkerbot story ends. If we fast forward to 2016, the second reboot season, we can see that there is no mention of any weight bonuses in this rule set, legs or otherwise. And if there are, then they're obviously not made very clear. That's probably the reason why the only walker from that year is Rex, who didn't even need a bonus because it's a gyro walker that uses the forces from its weapon to move. Then in the last couple of years or so, BattleBots have quite radically changed their policy on walkers. At least three walker bots, including Chomp and this huge thing known as Gloomweaver, were accepted into the 2020 season. Of course, we only got to see Chomp. This influx of walker bots was caused by an exciting addition to the rules that allows true walkers to be 500 pounds. That's more than twice the weight of your typical wheeled robot. But they didn't stop there. Robots that don't use wheels or legs, such as shufflers, may be eligible for a custom weight bonus if BattleBots decides that it's justified and it's not just an exploitation of the rules. They've hit the nail on the head with this one in my opinion, because there will never be one blanket rule that fits all these different types of robots. It allows for variety and creativity, but also includes the judgement of those most knowledgeable about the show. So we probably won't be ending up with another Son of Waiachi situation anytime soon but we do still end up with some remarkable works of engineering. We now return on our journey through the rulebook to the qualifying round of 2015, where Ghost Raptor was about to face complete control. And I'm sure you guys already know how the story goes. At almost every single BattleBots tournament after 1999, nets and any kind of entanglement weapons were completely forbidden. It's just how it is. The reason isn't because they nullify spinners as much, but rather because of how frustrating they are to watch and fight. All they do is cause a hindrance in the arena with very little skill involved. 2015 being the first reboot season had a lightened up rule set, according to Derek Young, builder of complete control. The only entanglement devices disallowed were ball bearings and fishing lines. Nets were so disallowed for such a long period of time, the BattleBots forgot to add them to the list. Anyway, complete control entered the arena with a net concealed in a gift box. Ghost Raptor was immediately entangled after the first hit, much to the annoyance of its team, but the match was stopped, the net removed after a lot of booing, and restarted. Despite Derek Young and the team's excellent spot, Ghost Raptor went on to win the fight with a broken spinner. This fight very much highlights the kind of unofficial rules held amongst the builders. Nets weren't mentioned in the rules directly, but most people would expect you not to use them in such a way, it's just good sportsmanship. However, after this, the embargo on nets officially resumed within the rule set. From here, we travel to 2016, the exciting second reboot season of BattleBots. For many casual fans, this was the introduction to robot combat as a sport, and many fan favourites such as Yeti, Minotaur, Bombshell and Cobalt made their debut here. Some of the most unforgettable moments of the modern era happened that year. But as iconic as this season was, it was plagued by questionable judges' decisions. Chomp vs Disco Inferno, Brutus vs Lockjaw, and my personal favourite, Sawblaze vs Razorback. Like Sawblaze spends 3 minutes speeding around the arena, ramming Razorback into the walls and manages to lose the fight for not using its primary weapon. It gets even more bizarre when you read the 2016 tournament rules. Aggression is judged by the frequency, severity, boldness and effectiveness of attacks deliberately initiated by a robot against its opponent using its powered weapons. Okay, fair enough. 
Attacking with a wedge or other passive armor is considered to be a defensive action and does not count towards aggression. Continuous attacks without using a powered weapon can reduce a robot's aggression score. You what? Sawblaze must have been in minus numbers by the end of that match. I can understand since the show was trying to gain the attention of, you know, casual viewers who don't care that much for pushing matches that there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, big, dangerous primary weapons in the first reboot seasons. But that passive armor rule is just nonsense. You'd think after the response from the community, this might have been changed for 2018. But no, it's still there, but this time it's in red and uses the word comparative. It appears to have been addressed by the time 2020 judging guide was released, since ramming opponents into the walls somewhat counts towards aggression now, and currently it's at a good balance. The rules still put emphasis on weaponry, which discourages robots from just trying to push their opponents around, but it also stops decisions from going the entirely wrong way as well. Several fights in 2020 would have been affected if this change wasn't implemented. I'm sure you will remember Beta vs Rotator. Beta chose not to use its hammer for the entire fight because Rotator Spinner was facing upwards, leaving it as a wedge that repeatedly threw Rotator into the walls. Beta's hammer did end up being cut off by Rotator, but it picked up the victory, sparking criticism from some of the builders, especially those with spinners. For years, people have been saying that BattleBots rules favour spinners, but changes such as this can give control bots a fighting chance once again. So overall, a good change, but long overdue. While this was going on, there was another bot called Helichop preparing to fight. Helichop was a massive bot with extendable cable hammers that spun at like 200 miles per hour, madly powerful. And the story of Helichopper is quite fascinating since everyone seemed to have a different idea about what had happened to it. Some say it caught fire, some say it was too unsafe and was banned. That was until one of the team members told us the full story on Reddit. I'll leave the link in the description if you want to read all of it, it's quite long. But here's an extract from it. We spun up, everything worked, we slowly ramped up, this was only for safety, so no need to push things hard. When the hammers were cruising at 1200 RPM, I saw another rag shoot off for about 10 feet, then suck back towards the bot due to the vortex we were creating. The rag entered the bot through the gap between the base and the spinning shell, went through some 3 inch cam followers and started ripping the studs out of the aluminium, then hit the battery box and started spinning the lipo batteries around in the shell. Then we had a huge fire and the bot burned to the ground. That sounds scary. To summarize the rest, they rebuilt the bot with a different weapon config, reduced the speed to about 30%, but BattleBots were still quite nervous about allowing them to compete. They ultimately decided to withdraw from the competition. But how does this tie into the rules? For one thing, the tip speed limit was changed from 200 miles per hour to 250 miles per hour, although most bots don't need to run higher than 250 miles per hour anyway for the reason of getting a good bite on an opponent. Secondly, any spinning weapons made of multiple parts like helichoppers, which was cables, hammers, and a shell essentially, needs to be pre-approved by BattleBots and they specifically request detailed statistics about the weapon as well like tip speed and energy and such. Safety is paramount, if something goes crashing through the battle box, the reputation of the sport goes crashing with it. Any rule needed to ensure safety is a good rule. So thanks Helichopper. Fast forward two years we end up in 2018, the first year of the exciting new fight card format and of course the last chance rumble. A rumble of six machines that would decide who gets the 16th seed. The six spots were Red Devil, Gigabyte, Valkyrie, Lucky, Duck and Bombshell. So it was chaos for the first minute or so. Bombshell got some good attacks with the spinner and eliminated Red Devil but suddenly stopped moving. In the meantime Duck basically tidied up the arena with some excellent attacks on Valkyrie, Lucky and it even used Gigabyte as an arena hazard at one point. But in the final seconds Bombshell came back to life, it didn't even hit anything, it just moved around slightly. And remember that passive armor reduces aggression rule from 2016. Yeah, Duck lost the fight, despite doing all the work. Its attacks were mostly rams and lifts, so yeah, under the rules it did lose out on points. Rumbles are strange in that bots don't get counted out individually, so Bombshell, despite being mostly immobile, was allowed to be considered for the decision. As far as I can tell, that rule hasn't yet been changed. In fact, as we mentioned before, the whole primary weapon rule itself has since been rectified, but the added complication of the rumble made this incident stand out more. Duck and Bombshell did settle the dispute with a rematch in 2019 which Duck won, so justice was eventually served. In 2019, we saw the debut of Deep Six, the biggest vertical spinner ever seen in BattleBots. It caused mayhem, often taking itself out along with its opponents. In its fight with Nelly the Yellybot from the UK, it knocked out its opponent before falling forward and leaving a huge gash in the floor. This resulted in the introduction of a rule known colloquially as the Deep Six rule, which limits the weight of individual spinning bars and discs and drums and egg beaters and things to 80 pounds, and spinning shells in cages to 120 pounds. Previously, the only kind of limit on spinners like that was that they had to come to a standstill within 60 seconds. But the battle box isn't invincible, and a limit like this prevents expensive, and more importantly dangerous, damage to the arena. 
Furthermore, you know those 500 pound walkers we were talking about before? It stops them from strolling into the arena with a shell weighing more than the opponent, as hilarious as that would be. So just in case Team Waiachi were getting any ideas for a 500 pound son of Waiachi, it's not happening. Now for some fun ones. Free shipping single-handedly caused a crackdown on flamethrowers that were longer than the 4 foot limit. After beating Bronco, it shot its flamethrower into the ceiling in celebration, very much angering the producers. Apologies, I couldn't actually find a clip of this. Flames aren't considered weapons anyway, since they look more destructive than they are. But BattleBots decided that after this, every flamethrower system has to be completely removable and that they can tell teams to get rid of them whenever they want to. Ribot in 2019, this innocent looking amphibian, used expanding foam to create its frog like appearance, but it caused such a mess in the arena that expanding foam was banned henceforth. They had to switch to vacuum form plastic next season. And finally, the thing you've all been waiting for, Hydra vs Huge. If you haven't heard about this match, it caused a huge commotion in the community. Huge is a tall bot with a spinner in the center, and Hydra is a flipper, but they attached this bike rack looking thing for this fight that would block Huge's weapon. The rack didn't block the path of Hydra's weapon and they showed that before the match. They just chose not to use it strategically, because they'd lose control of Huge. They did deserve to win the fight because, well, Huge couldn't and didn't really do anything. Attachments like that have never been banned before, and I hope they're never banned because adapting to the opponent is a very important aspect of the sport. Battlebots, however, did threaten to introduce a penalty for intentionally not using a weapon, but I don't think they picked up as much support for that as they'd hoped. There was a new addition to the rules, however, known as corralling. This was caused by Hydra keeping Huge in the corner but not physically touching it. Huge just couldn't have escaped even if it wanted to. Jake Hewitt tried to get away with this, but the ref dealt with it quite swiftly. Now it's all official. If a robot refuses to listen to the ref who is telling it to stop keeping an opponent in the corner, they can be counted out themselves. Quite a good deterrent, although I don't think anyone was going to try that strategy again anyway because of the backlash. Hydra vs Huge isn't a situation that will happen repeatedly, it was simply Hydra adapting to an opponent that would have definitely otherwise destroyed them spectacularly. Most teams won't need to do that now because the way to beat Huge has pretty much been revealed anyway. Try and get in the path of the spinner and stop it from getting a good hit like Whiplash did. This match, it wasn't an exciting match at all to be honest, and many felt that it wasn't even a fight. But seeing as the rack didn't interfere with the path of Hydra's weapon, there's no rule that can be implemented really that stops Hydra from using such an attachment that I can think of anyway. What are your thoughts on the matter? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you all very much for watching this video. I know it's been a while, but you know, life gets in the way sometimes, you know how it is. Excited to see the return of BattleBots for two new seasons at least, and it's coming to Netflix here in the UK, which is lovely. Are there any rules that I missed? Again, let me know down below in the comments. If you like the video, please consider subscribing, and I hope to continue to make these, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.